will be in Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. As we enter into a new year, we, as both the universal church and the local church, are presented with an exciting challenge. How do we minister in the midst and in the aftermath of a pandemic? And when I say minister, I'm not just talking about what the pastor or other leaders of the church do, but what every believer in Christ should do. As Christians, we are all called to be ministers of the gospel. But as we all know, this past year has been one of the hardest for just about every local church in the world. With the necessity of social distancing and mask wearing and the limitation of social gatherings, being a minister of the good news has not been easy. In light of the fact that the pandemic has greatly hampered the witness of the church, what the church needs most right now is concerted prayer, not only for its resilience, but for its effective witness in 2021. Here at New Covenant, what I would like for us to do in this coming week is to have a concerted, concentrated time of prayer. We seem to need prayer more than ever this year, but I would like this to be the start of an annual tradition at New Covenant Baptist. I would like the first week of every new year to be prayer week for our church, and I'll talk more about what that means later. Before we get to our text today, I want to look broadly at the state of one segment of the church, the Southern Baptist denomination, of which New Covenant is a part, and also at how our particular church is doing. It remains to be evaluated just how badly the pandemic has affected evangelical churches. But in the Southern Baptist churches in particular, it has been very hard. But even before the pandemic, it's been known that the churches of the Southern Baptist Convention have been in steady decline. The SBC lost 2% of its membership in 2019, which was the largest drop in more than a century, according to its annual report. Total baptisms fell by 4%, bringing that number down to the lowest it's been since World War II. For a denomination that has traditionally made the Great Commission a top priority, that is troubling news. For years, it was the more liberal mainline denominations that were in sharp decline, as evangelical churches were the ones that were growing rapidly. But over the past few years, even many of the evangelical churches in the Western world have been in steep decline. And that's not to say it's been all bad, though. There has been a good deal of growth in evangelical Christianity in the global south as of late. Yet that makes that contrast by many, for many observers to wonder if North America will soon go the way of Europe, which is almost completely secularized. Now make no mistake, God is still at work in the world and he will continue to bring people to himself until Christ returns. But as evangelicals who have said that evangelism and missions are top priorities, we need to take a sober look at our complicity in the overall decline of disciple-making. But what about New Covenant Baptist? How has our church done over this past year? Well, considering what a challenge this year has been, I think that we've done pretty well overall. God gave us a lot of strength and mercy in 2020. Even as we had to shut down for several months at a time, our giving numbers did not go down dramatically. You continue to be generous with your finances despite a poor year economically. But what I think has encouraged me even more is the mutual support of our members. 
During the months that we had to shut down, I heard from many of you that you were calling others to check up on them, sending cards and letters, and of course, praying for each other. The members of this church have made me even more proud to be their pastor over this past year. And I praise God for your faithfulness. But with all that said, I know that we can do better as a church. New Covenant has never been a large church, and there's nothing wrong with that. But we have seen a plateau and maybe even a decrease in membership over the past several years. And there are all sorts of explanations as to why that might be. But we have to acknowledge one of the main reasons, if not the reason, and it is that we have not been winning unbelievers to faith in Christ. And of course, ultimately, that's God's job. And none of us, despite how eloquent or gifted we might be, can win someone to Christ on our own. But my prayer, and I hope it's yours too, is that 2021 would be a year of bold witness and steady growth for our church. Maybe 2021 will be the year that God decides to do something amazing at New Covenant Baptist. But even if it's not the year, our job is simply to remain yielded to the Lord to do whatever he leads us to do, whether that results in conversions or not. We are merely ambassadors of God and messengers of his good news. The point of my message today is that what we need first and foremost is not more evangelistic zeal or some elaborate program but rather a massive outpouring of prayer to the Lord of the harvest. During Jesus' earthly ministry, he was not a lone ranger. He handpicked individuals to be his followers. But those followers, followers soon learned that being a disciple of Jesus was not a passive activity, but an active one. They are expected to immediately apply what he taught them and to be his ministers to the world. To be a minister was ultimately to be an apostolos, a sent one. Jesus knew that the world was full of those who did not know the one true God, and his time on earth would not be long. So seeing that great need, he gathered all of his disciples together and said this, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Now, Jesus uses a farming analogy to describe the situation before his disciples at that time and the situation before his disciples of our time. All we have to do is watch the news or look at the latest data about the religious affiliation of Americans to know that there is a need for a great evangelical harvest. If we look just at the state of Texas, we'll see that 77% of its residents claim to be Christian. But that leads 23% who are not Christians. And within that number, 18% have no religious affiliation at all. These are what sociologists refer to as religious nuns, N-O-N-E-S. They claim to be either atheistic or agnostic. And there are many polls that have been taken that show the rapid rise of religious nuns in America over the past several years. So the need for sincere engagement with the lost is before us, and it grows with each passing year. The harvest is indeed plentiful. Now look at the second part of verse 2. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers, into his harvest. Notice the first thing Jesus says in response to the need is not, therefore, draw up a program and start strategizing. Nor does he say, therefore, start recruiting volunteers. Nor does he say, therefore, start canvassing the neighborhood with flyers. No, he tells them to pray earnestly to God to send out laborers to reap the harvest. As history has shown us, no revival, no outpouring of God's Spirit happens that is not preceded by much earnest prayer. 
The starting point of everything we do as a church and as individuals should be on our knees in fervent prayer for God to act and for us to join him in his action. We should never think of ourselves as setting the agenda for the means and strategies of spreading the gospel. Nor should we take credit for any success we do have in our witness to others. In his first letter to the Corinthians, Paul had to push back against the tendency of many believers to divide themselves according to who had presented the gospel to them. Listen to his argument in chapter 3. He says, for when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. For we are God's fellow workers. If we think of ourselves as the ones who make God's church grow, then we can either fall into outright pride if we're successful, or we can fall into utter despair if we're fruitless. Either way, the focus is taken off of God and onto us, onto our own abilities, our own good works. It becomes more about feeling good about ourselves than being fellow laborers with God. Jesus didn't die on the cross so that we could feel good about ourselves. He died so that sinners would be saved. The church should not give into the message of self-fulfillment that is pushed so hard in our society. We should never soft-pedal the difficulty of being a follower of Jesus or the, the difficulty of being a minister of his gospel. The challenges that we face in the world are very real. In verse 3 of Luke 10, Jesus says that he sends out his disciples like lambs in the midst of wolves. We tend to think of those who are without Christ as lost sheep, and rightfully so. But as believers, we have to remember that we are still sheep too, who are dependent on our shepherd. There is an arrogance that characterizes some kinds of evangelism that we should take no part in. We must remember that we are no better than anyone else. We are simply forgiven sinners. More than anything else, we should be marked by humility. As ambassadors of Jesus, we are like sheep, but we are also like links in a long chain. We can put unbearable pressure on ourselves if we think that a witnessing encounter we have with someone is completely dependent on us for its success. But we have to remember that anyone who comes to Christ usually does so because of a long line of individuals that God has placed in their path that have influenced them to consider Jesus or maybe even spoken to them about the gospel explicitly. Our role is to be available to God's Spirit and to be willing to speak words of truth to them when the opportunity arises. And who knows, you might be the link that finally brings them home. In John 4, Jesus tells his disciples this. He says, look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into that labor. The fields are ready to be harvested. The question is, are we ready to join in the long line of laborers for that harvest? To be ready, we have to pray. And not just one time, but constantly. If we haven't already, we need to make prayer a priority in our lives. 
So practically speaking, what should this week of prayer look like for those of us at New Covenant? Well, I think it looks like setting aside at least 30 minutes every day for intentional prayer. And there are three main things that I want us to pray for. Number one, pray for your own heart as it relates to being a laborer of the harvest, an ambassador of Christ. Perhaps you need to pray for courage to step out of your comfort zone and have some awkward conversations with people about your faith. I know I'm one of those people. Or maybe you need to pray that you would have a sincere longing to see the lost saved. Pray for your heart to break for those who do not know Christ and are on their way to an eternity in hell. The second thing we should pray for is specific people that you know who do not have a relationship with Christ and for opportunities to share your faith with them. And the third thing is pray for our church. The vitality of our church is dependent upon whether or not we're truly being a witness in our community. Pray that our church would grow, not just numerically, but most importantly, spiritually. We all need to grow in Christ. None of us is exempt. Our battle with sin will continue until the day we die. Pray that our church would have a renewed sense of mission and a renewed vigor for the cause of Christ. I want us to catch a vision of what God is already doing in the world and for us to plunge ourselves wholeheartedly into that work. The second thing I would like for us to do as a church is to engage in times of fasting. Of course, it's not required, and it's not as if God refuses to answer prayers if they're not accompanied by fasting. But there are good reasons for fasting. Jesus taught us to fast in Matthew 6, verses 16 through 18. And godly men and women since the time of the Old Testament have sought the Lord in prayer and fasting. Fasting serves to strengthen your faith in God by denying yourself the sustenance and pleasure of food in order to remember that your ultimate sustenance and pleasure is found in Him. If you've never fasted before, maybe you should try it this week. Let's make it a goal to abstain from one meal a day and to spend that time that we would normally spend eating in prayer. So those are my two requests to you as your pastor, to pray for half an hour each day this week and to fast from one meal a day. None of this is some kind of magical formula that forces God to work for us. God might not see fit to make us fruitful this year. God's will is supreme, not our aspirations, no matter how noble they might be. All we can do is be obedient laborers in the fields in which he's placed us and watch him provide the growth. May we pray for harvest time at New Covenant today and every day this week. Thank you for watching, and I hope that you were blessed by today's message. If so, please give it a like. You can also check out the other videos in this series and the other videos on our channel. Please join us next week as we continue in our series on the Gospel of Luke. Now I'll invite you to join me in a closing word of prayer. Let's pray. Father God, we pray that we would be faithful laborers of your harvest. We know that there are many women, men and women out there who do not know you, who do not have a relationship with you. We pray that you would stir our hearts to have a desire to see them come to know you, Lord. We pray for boldness. We pray for a zeal to want to see the lost saved. And Father, it's not about church growth ultimately. It's about your glory and about bringing those home that you have set apart. Guide us, Lord, in the mission that you've given us as sent ones in your world. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.